Thank you for coming to this uh, MWI Board Council. Uh, I know a lot of you are here for um, uh, Kathy Mitchell's DS 455 comparative, pol comparative defense policy class. Uh, we think that this little channel will be a great complement uh, to that as you're learning about how other countries uh, you know, make and execute their defense policies. Our panel today is going to focus on uh, how the United States can work with those countries and their military. So our war council today is security assistance in the context of large scale combat operations. We have a, uh, a really great panel. I'm really excited about it. I think this is also our first MWI war council post COVID where we've actually brought in external speakers from uh, more than. Uh, thank you so much for making the trip. Um, so I'm uh, I'm Dr. Max Margulies. I'm the research director at Modern War Institute. I'll be moderating, which basically means just calling on you all for questions and, and answers afterwards. Uh, we're going to start today with Dr. Dr. and retired Colonel Frank Sobchak, who is MWI's new chair of Irregular Warfare Studies. Um, he had a 26 year career in uh, in the Army, including a number of special forces assignments, uh, including uh, platoon or sorry, team and company leadership positions in fifth group. Uh, he also led the official history of the Iraq war culminating in a 1500 page volume. So he'll have uh, lots of insight there. Uh, he has his um, MA in Arab studies from Georgetown University and his PhD in international relations from Tufts University uh, from Tufts Fletcher School. Uh, He'll be joining us virtually uh, to give comments first. Uh, then we have uh, Dr. Kyle Wolfley, Major Kyle Wolfley, an Army strategist at U.S. Army Cyber Command, uh, also a former assistant professor of international affairs in SOCH here. Um, he, prior to teaching, commanded two infantry companies in the 82nd Airborne and served as a platoon leader in Germany and Afghanistan. He's uh, published in a number of outlets, and most notably his book, his 2021 book, Military Statecraft and the Rise of Shaping and World Politics won the uh, uh, the um, Army Strategist Association's 2021 Andrew Krapinovich Award and was selected for the Irregular Warfare Initiative's inaugural reading list. Uh, he has a PhD in government from Cornell University. Uh, we then have uh, Major Maya Mullet. <laughs> I can think there was an R in there. I meant to. Sorry about that, especially as somebody whose name often gets butchered. Major, Major Maya Molina Schaefer, uh, who graduated from the Naval Academy in 2005 and commissioned as a Marine Corps intelligence officer. Uh, during her 10 years as a Marine, she deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan and earned a master's degree in national security affairs from uh, the Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, in 2015, she transferred to the Army as a Sub-Saharan Foreign Area Officer and was posted at uh, U.S. Africa Command, where she served in the J-5 and as Deputy XO to Ambassador Alex Lascaris. Uh, she then served as uh, um, served as the Chief in the Office of Security Cooperation at the U.S. Embassy in Niger for three years, and is currently a French instructor uh, and OIC of the Corbin Women's Leadership Forum here at West Point. And last but not least, we have uh, Major Sean Marquis, an infantry officer who served with 2nd Striker Brigade Command Team as a platoon leader and Company XO. Um, uh, 2nd Brigade at 10th Mountain Division uh, as a company commander. He has a BA in political science from University of New Hampshire and a master's in international affairs, uh, focusing in security studies from Boston University, currently teaching in the Defense and Strategic Studies program. Uh, he has experience conducting security force assistance during two deployments to Afghanistan, as well as uh, conducting joint training with the Japanese ground self-defense forces. So, um, a lot of different perspectives today. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Sobchak um, to talk about the role of SF in future conventional operations. Max, thank you so much for inviting me today. Yeah, also, thank you for being flexible and allowing me to, to shift to uh, virtual. You know, I kind of planned to do the boomerang, but because of the snow and everything out here in Massachusetts, I uh, really appreciate it, and thank you for dealing with the 1984-ish, you know, giant head in the screen behind you. Um, so I'm going to talk, as Max said, about Special Forces' role in security assistance in large-scale combat operations. And so what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to talk, you know, in four minutes 
of go from the strategic level kind of down to the tactical level. And so in terms of what special forces can do for large scale combat operations, security assistance, at the strategic level, three factors are really important. First of them is the condition or the status of the host nation military. Second, the whether national caveats are going to be in place or not. And then finally, what is the relationship with the coalition commander, be it American or host nation? And so first, you know, talking about the condition of the host nation army, you know, this is really important um, because is the army that you're going to be doing security assistance with, is it like a plug and play military where it already has a dedicated special operations forces? Or is it a military that is not as developed, not as capable, and that is going to need some basic, you know, ground level training to even get off the ground? You know, one of the kind of great debates within special forces right now, and I you know, would argue in some ways, my community is almost bipolar, kind of between wanting to do direct action, kill capture, or security assistance. But even within the security assistance, there's really a great reluctance to getting involved in training the regular conventional forces of a foreign military. Now, some of this kind of goes back really to the Iraq and Afghan war in that when initially the security assistance was set up to train those two militaries, the conventional forces had control over it. And there became this great debate between special forces and the conventional forces on how the Iraqi and Afghan military should be built. There was a fundamental disagreement and then special forces basically said, hey, well, you know, we're like KFC, we do chicken our way. If you don't want to create it our way, you can have that mission. We'll build their soft. There were also elements with, you know, size and scope in that, you know, special forces, there are only five active duty groups, you know, X number of teams per, each team is supposed to be able to train a battalion, but in, you know, with asterisks in reality, they can't really train a battalion effectively. So it became down to special forces generally trains the host nation special operations forces. And so that, you know, that becomes kind of one of the core questions. OK, what is the condition of the host nation military? Is it going to be training soft? Is it going to be have some sort of agreement where they're going to train conventional forces? Is it a plug and play military where they can pick up and start conducting operations? Secondly, um, national caveats. Um, are special forces allowed to combat advise? Uh, for example, the current situation we're dealing with in Ukraine is obviously U.S. special forces can't go into combat. You can't shoulder to shoulder work with your partners. Instead, you have to watch them launch at the FOB, say, have fun storming the castle. Good luck. And, you know, we'll be here for you when you come back. That's a very different relationship, especially when conducting after action reviews and building co uh, rapport and, you know, consistency and it creates different environment. Additionally, sometimes there are caveats in terms of what is the maximum number of boots on the ground they're allowed. Um, that will have a huge factor also in special forces and security force assistance. The case study of El Salvador, there was a limit of 55. Obviously, it's not a uh, large scale operation, but even in large scale operations, there's almost always some sort of ceiling and that affects special forces and the ability to train and on how many units they can train. Lastly is what is the relationship with the coalition commander, uh, be it host nation or American? An example here, uh, kind of the last time before Ukraine that really, really did large scale combat operations and security assistance with special forces was Desert Storm. The U.S. Uh, and coalition commander, General uh, Schwarzkopf, uh, basically despised uh, special forces and special operations forces and put great limitations on what special forces could do. There was basically no cross uh, flot, cross four line of troops uh, operations allowed until the ground offensive launched. It was very risk averse and there are uh, host nation or American commanders who still have that uh, kind of perception. At the tactical level, um, once those kind of broader issues are resolved, you know, you could either do unconventional warfare, you can do foreign internal defense and whether that be accompanying your partners or training them to do, conduct direct action, special reconnaissance, 
uh, counterproliferation or hostage rescue. Um, or you could be doing coalition assistance. For example, if you have allies or host nation units, you could be accompanying those units in order to provide a liaison, a ground truth of where the unit is located and what it's doing and its true capabilities back to you know, the friendly headquarters. Now, oftentimes, the, you know, they're not equipped with the same uh, blue force trackers or et cetera that the US forces have or even their radio communications. And so you're kind of dependent upon special forces tactically to provide this information back. And in the unconventional warfare, they could either be stay behind forces, again, kind of relying on what is the condition of the host nation army. In the Baltic Republic, special forces have been doing it, working and prepping for more than a decade. And there are literally caches available ready so that if Russia rolls across the border and small partisan groups already set in place, uh, this is similar to what existed during the Cold War in Berlin and the Berlin Brigade. There was a company of special forces there in civilian clothes ready to go as partisans um, living civilian lives. Um, and that's an unconventional warfare option. So these are kind of the tactical and strategic options that uh, special forces um, will be called upon to do potentially in large scale combat operations for security assistance. Sorry if I went too long there. That was perfect. All right, um, so good afternoon and uh, just want to thank uh, Dr. Margulies and the MWI team for having me back at, here at uh, West Point and I look forward to the discussion with the other panelists. And so what I've been asked to do is to describe the role of multinational exercises on deterrence, group power competition, and large-scale operations. And so what I want to do is first uh, tell a story about how exercises have evolved over time and then make an argument. And the story is going to kind of describe how uh, exercises went from largely unilateral in the 17th, 18th century, just single countries would put them on, to now these massive multinational exercises we see today, kind of how they've changed over time. And my argument is going to be that, in general, the Western major powers, such as us, the United States, uh, France, Great Britain, and Germany have done a better job of using exercises both for traditional reasons like deterrence and getting ready for war, and even what I call shaping, and I can describe that later, uh, than China and Russia have over the last 20 years. However, that might not be the case. China and Russia have invested a lot in exercises, so that we'll see what happens in the future. So here's the story about uh, exercises, right? So um, as cadets and future officers, uh, you're going to be engaging in exercises, if not daily, weekly, or monthly, um, pretty consistently, right? Whether you're practicing it on paper, in a rock drill, um, just bat wargaming with your NCOs, uh, or actually out in the field maneuvering, right? You're going to be engaged in exercises. So it's good to think about why we do these, right? So, you know, the most obvious reason is to prepare for war. And obviously, the, the story of warfare goes in with training and exercising to practice for it. Um, but by the 17th and 18th centuries, uh, European leaders started to see some value in, in hosting large scale exercises. So uh, Prussians, uh, the Prussian leader Frederick the Great was very famous for his international maneuvers. I mean, they were national in the sense that his troops would be putting on these large scale demonstrations, but he would invite foreigners to come observe. He would invite his friends to know, hey, jump on the bandwagon. We're strong. And, and, and when a war breaks out, you should be on our side and also to threaten adversaries, right? Not to mess with Russia as, a, as an emerging great power. Uh, exercises largely took place unilaterally throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, the Germans did these Kriegspiels, these simulations, right? To test doctrine, to make sure that uh, once war occurred, their troops would be ready for it. Uh, yet uh, exercises took on a different character, I would say following World War II and the establishment of permanent alliances. So with NATO came these kind of large scale multinational exercises where they would uh, test doctrine year to year, right? And exercise together. And kind of like uh, Frederick the Great's uh, exercises in the 18th century, they took on a more political purpose, right? It was more a signal, not just uh, to uh, adversaries, right? To deter them, to say that you know, uh, an invasion would be costly, but also to reassure their alliance partners, right? That they should invest in military hardware and they should Alliance. So what you get by the 60s and 70s are large scale. We're talking two, three hundred thousand soldier exercises on both sides of the Iron Curtain, both within NATO and the Warsaw Pact. NATO was famous for putting on Autumn Forge, which assembled all the NATO troops uh, conducted around 30 different parts of um, of Europe, which was combined with Reforger. You might have heard that term, which is the return of forces to Germany. 
And, uh, you know, large scale units, brigades, even division size in the United States would mobilize, right, and project power across the Atlantic again to test whether the soldiers were ready for uh, a large scale war against the Soviet Union, Warsaw Pact, but again, also to deter. So, to me, these are the traditional reasons we have exercised, right, to practice for war and to deter. But when the Soviet Union fell, right, and we have the end of the Cold War, NATO's still around. There's talk in the early 90s of expanding NATO. Uh, what else can we use exercises for? So, uh, you know, countries such as the United States, Great Britain, France, and Germany started using exercises to shape. And what I mean by that is to construct a more favorable environment. They went from these large scale division size exercises to squads and, and teams, meeting uh, people that were former en enemies, right? So, one of the First NATO Partnership for Peace exercises, which was part of this program, uh, was held in Poland in 1994 called Cooperative Bridge. And here, American soldiers got together with Polish soldiers and Czech soldiers and Hungarian soldiers who were former enemies five years prior, even Ukrainian soldiers, right? To just learn to be, um, learn at a more human level about where they came from and what they could bring uh, uh, in terms of security cooperation. And the idea was not, again, to practice for war. These are very small. It wasn't very good for deterrence, right? They're, they're, no one's really going to be threatened by these very small exercises. But the point was to try to convince uh, these Eastern European military officers and their publics, right, that cooperation with NATO was good, right? So it's not just military power in terms of the hardware, but also the legitimacy and the purpose, right, that NATO was seen as good. And so, uh, you know, you know, in, in terms of the, the, you know, the argument that I'm making is, uh, you know, I think there's been big dividends we, we've seen in, in the conflict with Ukraine. You know, the United States uh, building these relationships over the last 20 years in terms of access and basing and overflight, having these relationships, right, uh, where, where Russia, you know, Russia and China have both attempted to build exercise programs since the early 2000s, but they're much more limited. They have fewer participants. Uh, and again, I think they do pay dividends. But again, um, Russia uh, puts on large scale exercises. And uh, they very well may continue that um, into the future. But so far, the evidence kind of shows that uh, Russia has been largely alone in this and they haven't done as good a job of shaping. And, um, you know, and, and we'll see where China goes with it. So, um, you know, I look forward to the uh, discussion. Any questions you may have? All right, good afternoon, everyone. Major Lou Schaefer here. I'm an African Foreign Area Officer. So I'm going to kind of discuss about security assistance with regards to Africa and some lessons learned that I had as the OSC chief there in Niger um, from the time that I spent there and how it can be applied to security assistance um, for conventional warfare. Um, so first and foremost, um, it's, I think it's really important to define what security assistance is and why we do it, right? Security assistance and why we do it and the primary objective for us is to ensure that we're advancing our U.S. national security objectives in a specific partner nation, right? That is why we do it. And how do we do that? We do that with exercises, as we just talked about. We do that with training both in that country and also training um, that partner's uh, soldiers back in the United States. And we do it by having our allies here, um, bringing them to our schools. Um, we do that by professionalization. There's a number of different tools that we have to actually help um, empower and to forward our national objectives within that country. So with regards to Niger, why I went to Niger as the OSC chief there is that the U.S. was heavily investing in the Sahel at that time, specifically Niger. Um, Nigerian Defense Force, while Niger was the poorest country in the world by human standards, it had a very professional force and one that we found value in investing. We also use Niger for two significantly large logistical bases that we use to kind of employ our troops and to use it as a logistical base for other operations that we're doing within that region and within, I would say, Southern Europe as well. So it's a really important place that we maintain free access to both air-wise and also ground-wise. So it made sense for us to invest in Nigerians to make sure that they were a good partner. Um, we'd also saw a significant increase in terrorism, uh, both in ISIS West Africa along um, its western border with Mali and Burkina Faso. And then also Nigerians were also fighting Boko Haram kind of on their eastern border along Lake Chad. So for reasons we wanted a secure Sahel because we wanted to ensure a secure U.S. as well. Um, so when I went there, it was a very large portfolio as far as security assistance. I was managing as a major um, with just a shop of four other kind of officers and enlisted about $250 million worth of programming. 
anything you could think of as far as developing capability developments, I had my hands in. So air to ground integration, helping them with their C-130 program, their C-208 program, working on their logistical program, not only creating um, logistic battalions, but also helping them at that time with their huge special forces um, generation. They had this huge force generation where they were trying to double the size of their special forces. Um, so when uh, the main thing I kind of, the main lesson that I derived from my time there and managing all these programs was that at the end of the day, the best way to conduct long-term security assistance, um, in my opinion, is to work with our other allied partners and to coordinate assistance. And I'm gonna give you a quick example of how I saw this as very successful in Niger. So as I previously mentioned, the Nigerian forces were trying to double the amount of their special forces. They were trying to professionalize their special forces. They had very um, small amounts of equipment. They were very small. They didn't have any training facilities. Um, so I was lucky in that we had a special operations liaison officer working at the embassy. Um, so he was my main conduit to the special forces. And so he would go down and he would sit down with the Nigerian special forces commander and we would have the special forces commander dictate what it is they're trying to make their force look like. Because in order for security assistance to work, it needs to be led by that partner. Um, you need them to dictate their requirements to you so you understand where they're trying to grow to, what they're trying to be capable of. So when we sat down with the Nigerian Special Forces Commander, he's like, this is what I'm trying to build. This is the equipment that I think my forces are going to need. These are the schools that I need as well. Um, and it is a huge problem set. And I think the three things that are um, very important but also difficult about security assistance from the U.S. side is, one, we have limited funds as a country. We prioritize our COCOMs, we prioritize the countries that we invest in, and you never quite know where you're going to get from year to year um, for these specific countries. Um, the second is that the U.S. also has a very short attention span. So a lot of these capability developments take multi-years to develop. I can't develop an air-to-ground um, integration system in a year. That just doesn't work. Think about our military and how we've developed over years. Like It takes decades. Um, and so the problem with the fact that the U.S. has a short attention span is that, you know, one, for example, administration may think, all right, we need to invest everything in the Sahel right now because they're going to blow up soon. Um, but then another administration comes in, they're like, oh, Africa is no longer priority. We're now going to divert all our resources to, say, South Korea. So you quite never know what um, funding you're going to have from year to year. So it's really hard to invest in long term capability development with a partner because they don't know if you're actually going to be there for that long term. Um, another thing that's issue as well is that we're unable to address all of the capability gaps that our partners have, especially when we're talking about developing countries. Niger needed help in every single capacity from logistics to intelligence, communication, and we are unable as a single country to address all those gaps. Um, so it was one of those things for the example that I wanted to use to show how we actually were able to be successful is the Nigerian forces, uh, special forces development. So basically the Nigerian special forces commander dictate exactly what we need. We had a lot of other partners that are interested in investing in Niger as well for the exact same reasons that we were there. So competition is there as well with your ally, but also with kind of those global power competitions as well, like Russia and China are also there trying to bait your partner into helping them um, you know, whether it's providing equipment for access, whatever that is, everyone's competing for those same partnerships, for those same troops. So we sat down with our allies. So that's France, the Germans, the Belgians, the Dutch. We all sat down and said, okay, here, this is where they're trying to grow. I know from the U.S., like, this is my shop. I can provide training for this schoolhouse, or I can provide the equipment for the schoolhouse. The Germans were like, great, we actually have funding to build the schoolhouse, so we're going to build the infrastructure. The Belgians came in and like, we can't build anything, but we're really good at providing training. So we're going to help the Nigerians develop their doctrine and provide that training. So we all kind of sat down and took a piece of the pie. All the while, it was dictated by the Nigerians for what they wanted to build. Um, and it was extremely successful. The Nigerians were able to build. They have a special forces schoolhouse right now. We were able to develop, develop um, and provide all of the equipment that they needed for the schoolhouse. The Belgians and the Germans are there training right now. Like, it was a great example of how once you work with your allied partners, um, and you're able to provide what the partner nation actually needed and dictated, um, it becomes actually very successful instead of point on point and having programs that may start one year, but then we're unable to continue them after a year because we run out of funding or it's no longer a priority of focus or effort. Thank you. All right. Hi, everybody. Major Shell Marquis. Uh, good show to you guys. Good to see uh, some DSS students out here today. Um, but I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about security force assistance, security cooperation from sort of the uh, company level leader 
uh, perspective. The perspective that you guys are going to have as soon as you get ready to enter the force. Um, so I, I want you to know what does this mean for you and what can you expect to see when you enter the force? Because the first thing I want to get across to you is it, to be very clear is this isn't something that you're only going to see if you're a FAO or you're a strategist on staff or your special forces. They absolutely do this stuff and do great within that sphere. But all of you within your basic branches, within the conventional military, are going to see and execute these types of, of uh, training events and operations. Okay, so if, from my own perspective, I can sort of tell you about sort of the two ends of the spectrum as I see it. All right, so security force assistance, where you're trying to develop uh, capacity and capability, right? I worked with you know, Afghan forces, Afghan National Police, Afghan National Army to develop the most rudimentary basics of, of combat capability, right? So working at the squad level to be able to understand basic battle drills, basic field craft, this sort of thing, right? And throughout these coin operations that we've done over the last 20 years or so, right? That's been much of what we've been trying to do when conventional forces are going out there and executing this type of thing is how can we get them to be able to operate at that the sort of company level tactical capability, right? Um, however, that's that's not so much what we're as focused on anymore, right? As we've started to turn towards what does it look like in preparing for large scale combat operations? What does it look like when we're trying to orient towards China, right? And these peer and near peer threats, we start to look at other ways that we do this, right? And it's it's important to understand that while this might be somewhat of a pivot for those of us whose you know, service backgrounds are shorter, this is not something that's new for the U.S. military. Right? Conventional forces have been conducting security force assistance and security cooperation for a long time. Right? And to give some perspective, right, when we're looking at peer and near-peer threat, the Cold War is a prime example. There's the obvious cases. Right? We've got Vietnam. Um, and before that, right, Korea. We were in Korea prior to the Korean War kicking off doing this exact thing, right? And after World War II, we we're doing security force assistance and developing capacity within Japan, who's now right, one of our you know, greatest allies in the Pacific and helping us um, in a sort of balance against China. Um, but there's lesser known examples too, right? You think about right after World War II ended, um, Greece was facing uh, communist, revolutionaries, rebellions, these sorts of things. And the U.S. through the Marshall Plan, Marshall Plan was providing a lot of economic assistance. But with that, there was also military advisors, right? Down to the division and even below level with operational units providing expertise, providing training, providing assistance in various ways to help the Greek government overcome those, those communist entities, right? So it's it's been pervasive and it's been throughout our history that we've been doing this. Um, so, so what could that mean for you guys? Again, if we go back, it's entirely possible, right? There's still lots of, um, you know, violent extremist organizations out there. There could still be coin fights that you get involved in. But even if we shift away from that and look at other things, um, again, from my personal experience, I did a uh, joint training uh, operation with the Japanese Ground Self-Defense Forces. So I returned from my first deployment to Afghanistan, and that was right at the time the U.S. government, so about 2013, was doing the pivot to the Pacific, right? We identified that rising China could be an issue for us, and we wanted to, to do more in that region, provide more focus, um, you know, get more strategic messaging about what we're trying to do with our allies in that area. Uh, so for my particular battalion, that was going to be a joint training exercise at the Yakima Training Center in Washington State um, with a brigade from the Japanese Ground Self-Defense Force, uh, which is their army, right? And so they came over and for a month, we basically deployed into this training center and conducted joint training with them. But to be clear, that security cooperation, that exercise was vastly different than what I experienced in Afghanistan, right? Japanese soldiers don't need you to tell them how to conduct, you know, battle drill one alpha, right? They don't need you to tell them how to conduct uh, field craft in the patrol base, right? They are more than proficient in these areas. So what we're trying to do in that sort of environment is different. It's not about training those forces to be able to, you know, do things more like you or do them better than they currently do. It's about 
building mutual trust, understanding about building um, exchanges of ideas, right? So, you know, it's easy for us Americans, sometimes we can put the blinders on and think that everything we do has to be the best way to do things, right? But many of our partner militaries, while maybe smaller, um, have a lot of great ideas, great capabilities, and things that when you're training at the tactical level, you can pull some of those more finer points and TTPs from them as well. Um, and, and beyond that, you're purely the factor of cultural understanding and gaining an understanding of nuance. It was astounding to me when you're working with that allied force, there's so many things about military organizations worldwide that are the same, right? Things that, hey, their soldiers are like our soldiers in this area. Their staff, our staff. And, and you realize like, wow, we're not that unique, right? There's a lot of similarities. But you can also identify very unique nuance of differences, right? And, and it's not so much about, hey, I'm now an expert in how the Japanese army works, right? But you start to understand a greater conceptual understanding of when I'm working with foreign entities, here's the sorts of things that might be different. Here's the sorts of things that I can expect to be, to be somewhat similar. Um, and, and so I want to share an anecdote with you guys just to sort of give you some scope in terms of what I'm talking about. Right, so um, my company was tasked with doing a lot of the support for the operations that we were running out there. And as the company XO, one of my big missions was running the, the ammunition supply point. So we were moving out every day, everything from 5.56 five, rifle rounds up to Hellfire missiles for you know, the aviation that was out there with us. Um, so we had truckloads and truckloads of live ammo going out. At the end of the day, we'd have to bring in the leftover live ammo, the dunnage, the expended stuff, right? All of that together. And on the U.S. side, right, this isn't that big of a deal. It's just, hey, whatever you guys have left over that you don't shoot, let us know because we can send some vehicles to pick up live, but the live ones can't carry out the dunnage and that sort of deal. And so each day I'd touch base with all the different ranges and they'd give me that information. On the Japanese side, it was completely different, right? So I can never forget this. The first week we're out there, uh, I'm speaking with their with their ammo guy, and I'm like, all right, hey, this is how much I'm tracking that we're bringing out to you. How much are you estimating we're going to be bringing back in each day? Zero. Okay, yeah, so what if you don't make it through everything we bring out? Like, you know, we just need to be prepared because it's separate vehicles. He's like, no, no, we're going to shoot everything that you bring out to the specific round. I thought to myself, huh, you know, that's pretty curious, right? Because for us, Let's say you go out and somebody doesn't get qualified or somebody takes longer to zero. You might need more ammo. So you always plan, hey, this is what I think I'm going to need. You add 10% and then some amounts coming back at the end of the day. But it was to the specific individual round. When we went out that evening to go pick up the first batch of ammo, I brought an extra truck with me expecting that there would in fact be some live ammo, that there was some sort of, you know, cognitive distance there, right? You know, message received not the one cent, whatever. Sure enough, it was only dunnage that we were picking up from the Japanese units. Not only were we picking up dunnage, but individual casings were packaged back into the original ammunition boxes per each, right? Every single spent round was accounted for, repackaged, and shipped back. And this took place throughout the entire exercise, right? To the point where at the end of the exercise, they needed a report Discuss say, hey, here's everything that we're bringing back that's done inch and, and, you know, all accounted for. Well, we had, I think it was like one wooden box from some mortar shells that, I don't know if it had fallen off of a truck, got busted, broken, thrown away. They were missing a box from, from some mortar shells. And so they hit me up and I'm like, hey, you know, it might have fallen out of a truck. We've got trucks going by there all the time. We'll keep an eye out for it. We'll bring it in tomorrow. Next day came, we still didn't have it. So this is a, a, a brigade. XO, I believe, finally approaches me on this company. This is first lieutenant, right? Company XO, Marquis, being, appro being approached. He said, hey, this is missing and this is not acceptable. We can't return home without accounting for this, right? And I was like, well, sir, you know, I don't know what to tell you. It's a wooden box that used to house mortars and we don't have it. Like, it's gone. He's like, okay, well, we need to figure out what to do about this. I was like, sir, can we write a memorandum and I can sign off saying that it was me and my crew that lost this? Immediately, smile across his face. Yes, absolutely. 
if you sign off saying that this is your fault, it is okay. <laughs> so first Lieutenant Marquis, you know, there's probably something at the embassy somewhere today that says like, you know, Lieutenant Sean Marquis uh, has missing mortar ammunition or something like that. But just a striking difference in, you know, just tactical level logistics, uh, you know, and it's, again, it's small, it's nuanced, but it's the sort of thing that you begin to understand that this is the sort of things we need to think about when we think about cultural differences during this type of mission. Well, thanks. Uh, thank you all for those comments. Um, I would like to take the moderator's privilege to ask a first question and also give all of you some time to come up with some. Um, and I'm gonna make my first question a little speculative. Uh, so I know you all have a lot of great experience working with different countries in different contexts. Um, in based on that knowledge and kind of what you know about the Ukrainian context for security assistance, how do you think the role of security assistance in Ukraine right now and the challenges that we might be facing, how might that differ from what um, from the challenges or experience of security assistance in other con similar conflicts in the future? So like in what <coughs> what lessons can we learn from what's going on in Ukraine? What lessons should we not learn from Ukraine based on security cooperation in Africa or East Asia? Um, it's because you're right in between. Oh, got it. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the lessons we can take away, and maybe not a positive lesson, but a lesson learned, is that um, we often mistake capability as equipment. If I give you a truck, I'm like, oh, but clearly you now have a logistic capability, which is not true, right? If I don't have trained drivers, I don't have a logistic capability. Having equipment in itself is not a capability. Um, and I think we often mistake that because we're like, oh, well, they can't get over that mountain, so we're just going to give them a truck. Great. Awesome. Do they have trained drivers? Do they have spare parts? Do they have trained mechanics? Do they have the fuel to put in those trucks? We often forget about the logistical support that is needed when we're building a capability and the training that's required. Um, oftentimes, when I see countries also receiving a lot of equipment from different countries, they now have this hodgepodge of logistical equipment and ground movement equipment. Um, and how do they maintain those? How do we expect them to maintain them when they have a Japanese truck and a French blivet, you know, fuel blivet, and they have American um, rifles or something? Um, sometimes just throwing all this equipment at a partner is not at the end of the day going to build any type of capability because they're going to be limited about their limited by their ability to maintain it. Um, they're going to be limited by their ability to continue to buy spare parts for it. A lot of times when we provide equipment, American-made equipment, because we like them to buy American, because that also makes us money, um, we want them to buy their spare parts for them. Well, guess what? It probably takes a really long time from, say, Wright-Patterson or from Florida, or wherever those pieces are being made, and then sending them overseas, like in this case to Ukraine. So a lot of times I don't think the logistical um, train is thought about or the fact that it takes trained personnel to actually create a capability. Um, so I kind of worry about the future of the Ukrainian Defense Force, because when this is all said and done, what is the equipment that's going to be have left? What is the equipment that's still going to be working? Do they still have trained personnel? Because right now, it's, I guarantee you, there's like a million contractors over there that are maintaining all of this equipment for them, and we're helping to provide those spare parts. But what happens when those run out? Are they going to have their own um, financial, are they going to have their own defense budget to be able to buy those spare parts for whichever vehicles they have, or aircraft, we're talking about aircraft is even more expensive. Um, and then are they going to be able to maintain it? Are they going to have, you know, the same manuals in the right language for all of these different types of vehicles and equipment that we're providing them? So I think a lot of times we don't think about that, which is why I'm a big advocate for, hey, at the end of the day, if you if you have the time, right, this is a different scenario because it was like, we need to help them right now. So what do we have to give them? But if you're working with a partner that is more long-term capability development, is why I advocate, hey, you got to sit down with the partner really try to figure out what it is they're asking for instead of just kind of like shoving equipment in their face or training in their face, ask them what is it that they're trying to build and then help them to define those requirements and then work with other allied partners to actually provide them a cohesive program really at the end of the day. So that's kind of a lesson learned from you. Those are just my thoughts. Thanks. I guess, you know, my, my reaction to that question is uh, always a reminder that war is political. 
and the politics are going to have an impact on the level of resolve. So I don't mean political like Republican versus Democrat. To me, that's more of a partisan, right? But worse political meaning, you know, there's some sort of objective to be attained, right? This is a clash of wills, you know, amongst adversaries. And I understand Clausewitz is overused and you've probably learned about him. But, you know, if Clausewitz understands resistance as capabilities plus resolve, the capability side, right, as uh, Major Molina uh, Schaefer noted, you know, that's easy to measure. And you can hand out so much hardware, so many tanks and rifles. But can we impact the resolve, the will, right? What is it about the Ukrainian will, their desire, right, to fend off hordes of Russian troops and advanced precision technology, right, at huge cost themselves, but perhaps not that's not shared by other countries that we provide security force assistance. And I think people are really looking at the two case studies of Ukraine and Afghanistan, you know, about how, how do we predict how willing uh, soldiers are to fight for their country. And I think at that point, you got to look at the politics, right? Who benefits from this political arrangement? And sometimes these might be out of our control as platoon or, you know, company grade officers, but it's good to think critically about why are we handing this piece of equipment over? How do we know it's going to be used for purposes that we want as opposed to others? Anybody else? Uh, I mean, I could throw out just the, the reiteration of this is an occasion where we're not allowed to accompany our partner into combat. And so that anything that we're getting back, it's secondhand. Um, and, you know, we are very fortunate, I think, that the Ukrainians are like almost an ideal partner. But even with an ideal partner, you know, there's there's no such thing as perfection. And in some cases, you know, your partner will ask you for something that they think they really need. But in reality, they don't understand all the logistics, all of the challenges that kind of come with that, all of the training, the lead time that is required to get forces ready. And you just can't, you know, pick someone up, train them to, you know, uh, uh, pull a pack on an M1 in just a couple of days. It's this not possible. It's not possible, you know, even with a computer, just the downloading it, it would take longer. Um, so there, there's just that, I think, component that's really important to remember is that when you're not allowed to accompany your partners into combat, in some ways there are advantages because you don't have the gigantic, the Borg of the United States there that is kind of doing everything for the partners sometimes. Um, but on the flip side, you also don't really know what's going on. Sometimes you also get the case of survivor uh, bias where, for example, a unit comes back from the front and says, hey, we need A, B, and C. Well, they need, they think they need A, B, and C, but the challenge is, what about unit, the other unit that got wiped out? Why did that unit get wiped out and this unit survive? That's kind of a really other critical question that in many cases, if you don't have, you know, uh, partnerships fighting shoulder to shoulder and the ability to combat advise you're going to miss out and in many cases you're highly dependent upon your partner thank you i love that uh that you brought up this point about what happens when the you know what the partner wants differs from what the what the u.s wants or thinks they should have um, i think that's a, a really interesting tension that i hope we can come back to could I throw a second thing on that real quick? Go for it. So sometimes it is practical, you know, in the case of the M1. It's, you know, hey, this is a gas turbine engine. It's complex. It's really difficult. Or in the case of, you know, some nations uh, in the Middle East who are conducting counterinsurgencies and they're like, we want F-16s because they're a counterinsurgency platform. Um, but other times it is political where there's an element of, OK, well, we don't want this to escalate uncontrollably. So yes, we recognize that it would be great for you to have this, but we're worried that things are going to, you know, get out of hand. Some time for questions from the audience. Anything at all about any topics? Yeah, John. Uh, oh, the panel, I'm going to G1. Uh, the Wall Street Journal report came out today describing our inventory as uncomfortably low as a result of the war in Ukraine. Uh, I'm just wondering how you all see us adapting our strategy to Ukraine and our partners across our other areas of interest. Always nice to throw the curveball with the uh, the news article that just came out. 
You said the inventory is low? All right. Uh, our inventory yes, sir. Our, all our weapons inventories that we've been sending over are uncomfortably low and they will be replaced very quickly. Process time for 18 to 24 months. Yeah, I was wondering about that. Yeah, I mean, so I think that goes into, you know, what is military power and what is our strategy? So what I mean by that is, you know, is the best use of, a mil uh, of the American military to build up our own force to protect ourselves against threats like China and Russia? Um, or is it to assist other militaries, right, to have them, um, you know, absorb some of the burden for it? And I think that gets into a, alliance politics a little bit, you know, and um, do we do we build up ourselves and, um, you know, try to assume the security just for, you know, within the United States? Um, or do we adopt a strategy of kind of sponsorship where we, you know, arm other countries to protect themselves? You know, I'm thinking of Taiwan, and, uh, you know, against China in that scenario. Um, you know, does the United States, I don't, you know, obviously we don't seek a conflict with China by any means. Um, and what are the likely scenarios? You know, it may be the case that arming other countries to protect themselves might be, um, might be the best use of our power. I, I don't know. I mean, obviously it's uncomfortable to have stock levels that low, but I think we do think about what is the strategy here. And I think you bring up the fourth question. Thanks, Snapchat. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Subject, you Sorry, want to yeah, I apologize. Yeah, I, I, so I think, you know, it gets to what is your strategic objective? Um, and, you know, in many ways, we are fighting a proxy war, uh, without a doubt. We are, we are Russia or China supporting the Vietnamese, and we are bleeding Russia dry. Um, so in many ways, to me, that is strategically wise um and there is without a doubt uh you i mean you name it artillery stingers javelins we are months if not years backlogged going to be backlogged in production um I, I was actually looking up to see if i could find where when the last stinger was produced because if i recall correctly like the production line ceased um so they had to literally restart the production line so to me, the challenge is, is at this, the grand strategic level is that the United States, we, you know, we believe in a peace dividend. We believe that, you know, that it's not a dangerous world out there and it's OK to kind of keep these minimal, you know, levels of our defense industrial base going kind of barely on life support, whether the shipbuilding, which is another core grand strategic issue or ammunition. Um, to me, I think. I would thank my lucky stars that we're kind of getting this wake up call now and not in the middle of an actual fight with a peer competitor, um, because hopefully someone is not asleep at the switch and someone goes, wow, we need to like, you know, retool our defense industrial base and make sure that we're producing stuff at a certain rate because the burn rate in a large scale con in a conflict is astronomical. Yeah, I think another interesting point to kind of mention this too is, um, as I mentioned before, both my experiences is predominantly in Africa with partners that always need kind of everything. Um, there are forces that are still being developed. Um, anything you can think of, they have a vacuum, so they need rifles, everything down to vehicles, to logistical equipment, anything. Um, and it's one of those things that they need it so badly because the fight is at their door right now. Like they're actively fighting against terrorism every single day doing cross-border operations on every single part of their border as well um, with a relatively small defense force and so they would come to me and be like this is what we need right now and if you can't provide it you know it's not that we want to work with other people it's not like we want to work with China but at the end of the day this is this is a need that we have right now if you can't provide it to us we're going to find another partner that does and for us, it's always in our best interest. We want to be the partner of choice, right? We want to maintain our access there. We want them to essentially secure that region so we don't have to send troops to, to do it as well. Um, and so I think it's an interesting question because there's always going to be competition there. And at the end of the day, we want to be the partner of choice, but how much can we really provide? At what pace can we provide it? Because I'm a great partner, but it takes me a really long time just based on the way that our budget works and based on the way that we do security assistance, that it takes me actually two to five years to get something that I actually need to their door. Like that's how long I have to plan out. I'm usually planning out two to five years before I'm able to provide them anything. 
Now, sometimes if they come and it's a different partner and they can buy stuff, like they are saying, hey, we want to buy some of what's called access defense articles. Like we have old equipment that they can buy and it's readily available, then absolutely we can make that faster. But a lot of times the partners that I was working with didn't have that defense budget, budget to support that. They were looking for pretty much like free equipment that we wanted to provide to them. So I think it's always interesting that if that vacuum is there, if they have that need, they're going to find someone to provide that need. They're going to find that somewhere. And at the end of the day, we want it to be us that's providing it or an allied partner. But sometimes we can't compete with the fact that China can just show up and provide all this equipment within a month. Like I've seen it happen. So. Yeah. I wanted to go back to you real quick. I think the second part of your question, you asked something about either allies or partners. What, what was that piece again? Uh, so how it would affect our other areas of interest like Taiwan and the Sahel, um, a shortage of equipment and supplies would actually get third partners. Okay, so I think that's a great area to think about and, and to be considered, right? Because there's a couple aspects of this. One is, what does our support for Ukraine show all of our other allies? Right. If we stop supplying, if we cease what we're currently doing or cut it back, that sends one type of message. Right. Hey, maybe we're less reliable, can't be counted on. Maybe we lack the capabilities that they thought we had. Right. This sort of thing. So there's a limitation there. But there's another piece to that as well. Right. So a lot of the U.S. stockpiles on arms and ammunition aren't sitting in like, I don't know, some bunker in Ohio. Right. So we've got mass amounts of artillery ammunition that's in South Korea, right? We've got lots of it that's located. I didn't know about this until recently, but Israel had a, a huge bunker with tons of 155 rounds. And recently it's come out that, hey, the U.S. is pulling a lot of our ammunition from some of those stockpiles. In the uh, particular case with Israel, it sort of, it, it didn't go great, right? Because at first Israel said, hey, look, we can't be on Russia's bad side because we have to cooperate with them up on our northern border in Syria where we're striking terrorist targets and they deconflict the airspace there, right? It's like, hey, you can't ship stuff that's in our country that we're kind of like custodially responsible for to go shoot at Russians because we can't afford this sort of reputational hit, right? So there's this whole other aspect of if we're moving stocks away from other allies, what message is that sending and how does that interaction work? Um, which doesn't answer your question, but at least shows a lot of the complexity that's there, right? A talent management question. So security assistance, awesome, great. We were all taught as young officers in, in, in the counterinsurgency fight that the training teams to advise and assist the Iraqis and the Afghans were the best weapons we could do in counterinsurgency. But yet our fitness reports and our evaluations, when stacked up against a company commander and a line unit, didn't hold the same water. Dr. Sobchak, in your research, uh, looking at the Army in Iraq, and in my experience as a Marine in Iraq, we echo this, but what does the Army, what do you think the Army needs to do with talent management to ensure that security cooperation and security assistance is actually valued on those promotion and selection boards for future command, future opportunities? Yeah, this is one I could like talk about for an hour about. Um, so, you know, Iraq, Afghanistan, especially in the beginning, the MIT teams, the transition teams, let me just be polite. They were a train wreck, okay? Um, and they were a train wreck for many different reasons. The location of the training kept changing. The amount of training was barely minimal. They put the people together as like a pickup team, right? You're, this is your theater strategic objective, your exit strategy, and yet you're taking 12 people, putting them together as a pickup team, where the first occasion that they're meeting is two weeks before their deployment. Great, awesome plan, that's gonna work. Um, additionally, like you indicated, there was no institutional protection for those people. They were told, hey, you'll, you'll, we'll take care of you on promotions. Initially, in many cases, the, you know, the selection criteria for a MIT team was, okay, well, you don't have a right shoulder patch, get on the bus, you're going to Iraq or Afghanistan. Um, and it evolved over time. And it's at one point it became the, the command position became a 05 command or an 06 command. That's a step in the right direction. 
But if you really want to get it right, it's got to be deeply institutional and it's got to be something that is seen as respected. And I think the security force assistance brigades are a step in the right direction. But the challenge with the SFABs is that they're an open circle. Or excuse me, they're an open cycle, right? And so someone goes into an SVAB and they're not they're not an advisor. They go back to another job somewhere else. And so if they're not just competing you know, primarily within people within their own branch or their own specialty, well, again, that you get back to that same issue. OK, well, you could have been doing, you know, a second command, but you're as an advisor or maybe you didn't even get a command, but instead you did an 03 time as an advisor or a SVAB company advisor. Good luck with your promotion on that. Um, so to me, for it to be successful, you have to institutionalize it. And in some cases, you almost have to do what special forces was, is you have to make it a branch and you've got to make it compete within that that pipeline. Sorry for talking too long. Oh, thank you. Anybody else have thoughts on that? Yeah. <laughs> Questions for the audience? Stood first, but we'll have time for you next. <laughs> Ma'am, Beck Cassidy, C2. Uh, I have a question about the Tongo Tongo ambush and how that affected uh, security force relations, uh, systems relationships in here. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for that. Um, so really interesting. I was actually at Avercom when Tongo Tongo happened. Um, for those that know, it's uh, an ambush that happened in uh, in Niger that killed uh, three of our special U.S. special forces as well as Nigerian soldiers as well. It was kind of the first time I think the public was aware that we even had forces that were in Niger um, that were even doing anything like security assistance on the special forces side of the house. Um, there was a lot of surprise, like why questions of like, why do we have the U.S. there? Why do we care about the Sahel? Why do we care about Africa? What does this even mean to our security? Um, and when I was at AFRICOM, I was actually the deputy executive to um, our deputy commander for engagement. So AFRICOM is head by a four star. It changes in branch. At the time, um, I was under a, a Marine four star. He had a three star Air Force officer who was the deputy commander for operations. And then he had an ambassador from the State Department who was the deputy commander for engagements. And I was working for the ambassador. So it was really interesting because I kind of got, I was in the room with the four star. We were actually in Washington, D.C. for staff talks. And when Tongo Tongo went down, and I was in the room when General Walthouser got the call, and he was talking with this J3 of Africom, he's like, and it was reported like, hey, we've had this attack. This is we at, at um, when it initially happened, we had one of our soldiers missing. Um, so then there was, you know, what are we going to do about it? What assets do we have in the area to send out for sorties and for QRF? And we didn't have a lot of assets. We didn't have a lot of ISR, which is kind of played out in that whole kind of issue of like. OK, we have forces operating in Africa, but do they even have the right assets they need to conduct these operations um, and what are they doing there? So it was really interesting because I think it did change the relationship we had with Niger. One, it brought Niger to the forefront of the public. Like, again, not many Americans even knew we had soldiers on the ground in certain African countries and what we were doing there. Um, so it made Niger kind of a household name, which also brought a lot of scrutiny of like, OK, what are the special forces there? What is their mission there? What is what are we trying to accomplish with our partners there? And um, I will definitely tell you that we saw a, a decrease in what the special forces were allowed to do with partners because of that. Um, we used to be able to go out to train, advise in a company, and then that got slashed. And now we we're just training and advising. You're no longer allowed to company. And as what the colonel said, that actually hindered us a lot because we were just training them and then they were going out and doing operations. We had no idea what was going on in those operations anymore. We were just relying on the kind of the reports they were bringing back. Um, we, <laughs> there's a lot of issues with other African countries that, you know, um, Nigeria is working hand in hand with, like, the Malian forces, Burkina Faso. We also worked with the Chadian forces. They operated sometimes in a different, what do I want to say, capacity, a different professionalism than the Nigerians operated in. And so we had issues with like war crimes and um, uh, when they were, you know, these, this is open source that the Chadians were, um, you know, killing women and children and raping them. And now there's an issue of like, we no longer can work with those type of forces uh, and were the Nigerians there and what were the Nigerians doing for part of this? And it, it got really complicated because again, we lost our eyes on the ground. We were just reliant on what the partners were telling us when they came back and kind of like what he meant, like uh, he said before, like survivors, like we wanted to believe the Nigerians 
um, and assumed that they were being a professional force that was going on where they're doing these cross-border operations against Boko Haram or ISIS West Africa. Um, but we no longer had that information and we lost a huge amount of intelligence resources as well from that. Because um, again, we don't have our eyes out there. So I think it changed our partnership a lot and then it limited us a lot more because now there's more scrutiny. Um, it, it took away our ability to uh, really go out and do kind of partner operations with them, which also meant that we lost a lot of our relationship with the Nigerians as well, because it's one thing to train you and say, okay, good luck, like high five, like hope you guys don't die, like hope this goes really well, right? And then there's another thing to say, hey, I've got your back, you know, here I am on your left flank, like we're gonna take, we're gonna take it to the enemy with you. Um, so relationships really significantly changed. And I would say that it took us a while to build back up our relationship with the Nigerians to the part where they would still open their door to us when we had questions or or needed information, right? Like we asked them for as much information as they asked for us um, because they were able to gather information of what was going on, the atmospherics in different villages and where the enemy was going and what, and what was happening. Um, so I think it definitely affected our relationship with them. And um, as far as security assistance, it really kind of hindered what we were able to provide to the to the special forces. So I hope that answered your question. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So good afternoon. Could I Andrew Young Company? My question for the panel is: What are the metrics for Ameri for measuring American success in security force assistance operations in host countries uh, that have like weak military? Very hard question as well. <laughs> I would think just to get the ball rolling to the panel, I think that it would depend a lot on, on this key point that a few of you brought up a few times about like what is the purpose, what is the advantage that the US wants to receive from the relationship? Is it short term? Is it long term? Um, what kind of fight is it? Um, I think that's what makes it such a important but difficult question to ask is there's it's very contingent it's very political yeah no, i mean this is something i wrestle with all the time right um you know it, it's one thing to say measure the inputs like the number of meetings we had with the foreign country the dollar amount of equipment we sent them i mean i think in the army we or the joint force call that a measure of performance but basically it's your input you're, you're something that's causing something else but what is what is the effect, right? And that's what you're getting at, right? What are we getting from all this investment? So to me, like what a success story would be is that, you know, say we do security assistance and uh, 20 years later, that army joins us in a military operation when they otherwise wouldn't have. That's the counterfactual, right? Um, another one would be, did we get access to overflight rights to their bases? Um, were they successful in doing an operation on their own that they didn't need us anymore? Right, but then you're getting into counterfactual thinking, like history, like what if, you know, this changed uh, in history, would it played out differently, right? Um, but that's very difficult, right? Because there's a lot of things that can cause a country to want to join war or to give you access or basing over flight rights, domestic politics, right? Their culture, their national interests. Um, so I, you know, I charge you all with thinking these questions, right? If we're giving this equipment or training, what are we gonna benefit from it? And, and that's my take is it's very hard to calculate. I think we got the uh, oh. subject. Is it okay if I answer on this one? I don't of want to talk too much, but yeah. I, I, I love this question. This is one of the most important questions. This is the million dollar question. You know, are you getting the bang for your bucks, right? And, and in Iraq and Afghanistan, we totally did it wrong. Um, we The metrics that we created basically were what percentage is manned, what percentage is equipped, and less than 25% were less than 25 percent of this you know beautiful green yellow red you know traffic light system um was on actual training um so i would say that metric was wrong and i when we did the iraq war study we had this a uh, brit you know the brits are always super honest um actually tell us about his experience with the american metrics and he said something like he said, yes, you know, whatever I put on the thing, it didn't matter because no one read it, read the, you know, the, the, you had, you had a, the section where you check off the, the numeric uh, amounts, and then you had the section there where you would do the write up. And he said, I wrote whatever I wanted to in there, and no one ever li listened, and no one ever paid attention. One time I literally wrote, uh, yes, this Iraqi battalion is fully manned, 
it's fully manned with Sadrist militiamen who are killing their Iraqi countrymen, assassinating the police, and intimidating their political opponents. Green. Um, so that was a you you know an example of a metric that fails on on, on you know. And this is what something, you know, something that is really challenging, I think, for for the United States. I would throw out what I used. Um, I don't know. I'm going to geek out here a little bit. Some of the challenges I think in the U.S. military is we like to make everything numeric. We're we like hominy, you know, the the theorists that thought everything that could be calculated, right? And so we try to calculate this, but when in reality, it's just much more. It's an art. It's not a science. And, and it really boils down to your, your finger spitz and spiel, your, your commander's sense of the battlefield of are they really capable of fighting? And to me, I would boil it down personally. When I trained with partners, I boiled it down to four things. OK, one, can they fight at night? OK, if they can't fight at night, you're not you're not useful to me. Two, uh, can they do intelligence led operations? Can they, whether they have scout platoons, human intelligence, whatever, can they do the targeting cycle where they get some intelligence themselves organically? Again, could be a scout platoon, then process it, plan, conduct an operation, gather intelligence from that operation, then go the whole cycle again. Okay, and this applies to low intensity conflict or high intensity conflict. OK, third, can you do combat operations for 72 hours or more? To me, that means logistics, ammunition resupply and casualty uh, evacuation. All that's going to happen if you're in contact with the enemy for 72 hours. Lastly, how do they perform in the against the enemy? You can just, you know, you use as an outsider when half your units, even if you're not accompanying them, half your units aren't coming back. That tells you something. And you can assess that's how they're performing against the enemy. Sorry to geek out. No, that sounds super helpful for everyone. So thank you. Uh, we have time for another question, maybe two. Yeah. Is that Michael Hager, Company D3? Uh, with the world changing everything and the US uh, plans folk now leaving the Middle East and going towards uh, people like Russia and China, how does the uh, strategy of winning hearts and minds change for the US? Uh, while also still being in places like Africa and still in the Middle East where we might be running some of those similar uh, like pseudo humanitarian processes. Yeah, so um, in terms of that one, you know, winning the hearts and minds was very much like a, a coin originating term where it's like, oh, we're looking at the village level. How do we try to get these people on our side and that sort of thing? But I'd throw out there when we're looking at preparing for large scale combat operations and the shift where it's, you know, peer and near peer threats, I think it's better to sort of try to reframe that into like soft power, right? And, and like reputational power, that information piece of, you know, dying, the instrument of national power, right? What we're trying to do is to make sure that, you know, the other entities out there globally look to the US and want to align their interests with our interests, right? And so how do we do that? And that's when we're talking security cooperation, security assistance. That's a huge piece that the military can play into the diplomatic and information sphere that prepares us for this global competition. I definitely add to that as well that I think a lot of times we think of these um, like conventional warfare, we think of it in purely military terms, when really it's a whole of government approach to a lot of these conflicts. Because when you have a conflict, what comes after it? Obviously, there needs to be like the NGOs, needs to have development that goes into it. You know, first and foremost is security, then afterwards, what happens? How do you rebuild the nation? So I think a lot of times we forget that we don't just operate as a military alone. We operate in coordination with the State Department that is working on the diplomatic relationships. We're working in hands with the USAID, which is doing that development work that's really important. So they're in the you know health and they're in like all the different types of development sectors with regards to that. And so I think it's really important that we look at it from a greater lens as a whole government approach and not specifically just military terms. Because when I was in Niger, I worked very closely with USAID. Um, I also had civil affairs teams that were going out and, you know, 
kind of trying to build the hearts and minds of really they're just developing relationships with the local leadership. So they're building wells or they were helping to build schools or providing, you know, school supplies, whatever we could. And really that was for us just to maintain access and develop those relationships. Because at the end of the day, we want them to turn to us and align with us is going towards, in you know, Niger's case, terrorist or, or Boko Haram for that case. Um, but at the same time, there was way more at USAID operatives and programs going on than I ever had the funding to for humanitarian, um, what we call, yeah, humanitarian, um, I guess, events there and, and programs. Like my budget for humanitarian stuff was tiny. There was very, there's, as far as DOD is concerned, that is not, you know, really what we're super focused on. I think it helps out when it comes to, um, like I said, developing those relationships and ensuring that they're coming to us with information versus other people. Um, but it's really the bulk of the work of the other part of the U.S. government, which is USAID, who has billions of dollars to invest in the local economy, invest in the healthcare, invest in everything else. So I think it's really important not to not to forget that this is not just a military um, initiative. Yeah, I think that's a really great question to build, especially building off some of what we were talking about with the previous question about metrics of success, um, the long term uh, relationship and sustainability. I mean, I it, so I'll just amplify what what uh, our panelists have been saying, like, thinking about the consequences, not just in terms of military cooperation, but the relationship you're generating with the population as a whole, because that's where the soft power is going to, to come in. And it's it will also help to that end. It, it's important to be thinking about yourselves as representatives and ambassadors, uh, because as I'm sure uh, Dr. Wolfley can talk about, right? They, this is whenever there's these exercises or bases, there's a great literature that I've been reading a little bit on, like American based politics and their effects in host countries, yeah. right? Like that's a huge influx of of Americans that are coming there that the local population is interacting with maybe for the first time. And I would say almost like a, to turn this on the flip side, as, you know, we're kind of assuming that security cooperation is good, right? We're just trying to get it to work. You know, I would I would encourage you to think what well, what's the dark side of shaping the security cooperation, right? How could this backfire? Is there any blowback, right? Um, if we funnel, you know, training and aid to another country, would that escalate, you know, um, a crisis or our relationship with the, with the rival? Uh, obviously, you know, China and Russia are rivals, but how how bad do we want to escalate things? Um, you know, with our experience and in, in, um, Colonel Sobchak probably has you know more knowledge and experience with this, but. When you give weapons to um, a partner like the Iraqis or Afghans, uh, you know, what's the likelihood that they're going to hang on to those weapons? What's the likelihood that, you know, they're going to lose them or hand them over willingly to the enemy, right? So I think we need to think of security cooperation too as don't just assume it's always good or going to work out well in the end. But again, think about the negative consequences because I think that's our job as officers to think through these consequences. Well, I think that's a great note to end on as we are basically out of time. So thank you all for coming. Thank you all to our panelists for already. Please keep your eye out on uh, MWS website, our YouTube page. Uh, we do, we will post these on our social media platforms. Um, and if you'd like to get in touch with, with us or any of our panelists, just let us know. Thanks for coming everyone. <laughs>